welcome to yet another edition of Thinkly Talks, a place where we have conversation and dialogues with some amazing people from around the world. So today we are back in Jaspreet's community, Lunarity Dialogues, to take a conversation with him forward. You know, so Jaspreet, a very warm welcome to you, and great to have you back here. Hey, thanks, Vivek. Uh, good to be back after a week, and thanks to everyone who's joined. Right. You know, so Jaspreet, we touched upon multiple topics last time, and I think we honestly felt short of time, and that's why this whole thought about, you know, kind of uh, diving deep into multiple topics, because there's just so many dimensions to AI. It's just not about technology or the compute power. Uh, last, I think last week, you kind of, you know, touched upon the overview of what happened in 2023. We talked about ethics, regulations, a bit on AGI. We just about scratched the surface of consciousness, right? But today we are going to be doubling down, you know, this whole thing on AI and politics, you know, uh, specifically AI, deepfakes and democracy, right? But I thought, you know, before we just kind of uh, go down this rabbit hole, and it's going to be a very interesting rabbit hole, I'm sure, you know, there have, as always, like Jaspeet said last time, I mean, every week there is so many announcements that keep happening on AI, right? And it just kind of blows you away. And I think there were some developments that happened over the last seven, 10 days, which uh, not only, you know, kind of blew our mind, but have a huge relevance and impact to what we're discussing today. So I just thought, you know, maybe we just take two, three minutes to just kind of run through that and... Uh, uh, let me just uh, quickly share my screen and uh, take it from there. One second. You know, so so like we saw, I mean, if you look at it, uh, last week again, uh, you know, AI didn't disappoint us. I mean, I think one of the big news was the fact that uh, how, you know, OpenAI is currently on track to kind of hit 2 billion, which I think really surprised a lot of people because there's been a lot of talk about it, AI being this hype that you naturally see. And, and, and of course, you know, out here, you know, it's apparently doing an ARR of around... Uh, $2 billion doing around $160, $170 million a month, uh, largely on the back of its, uh, you know, subscription. And as was, uh, you know, the API they're sharing with Fortune 500 company. So I think that was interesting. Uh, just speak. And I think the other thing which really, I think, blew the socks of people was when he talked about uh, seeking trillions of dollars, you know. So, you know, to kind of reshape, you know, the business of chips in AI. Because apparently he wanted, he just believed that there's such a scarcity uh, of chips right now, the compute power that's required, right? And, you know, uh, so Wall Street Journal reported $7 trillion is what, you know, Sam Altman was looking for. Um, of course, uh, there were a lot of memes around it. Some people said that this is possibly the time. This is where he's kind of got it wrong. And, you know, just with some thoughts on this. Sure. There are three numbers actually here, which are very interesting. And two of them you have put here, Vivek. Uh, so this was about 10, 12 days back. So one is, yeah, that track to hit $2 billion, which frankly doesn't surprise me. Actually, yeah. four numbers. And these $2 billion come from another number which was uh, divulged, which was 180 million now regular subscribers uh, mm -hmm. to ChatGPT. And over and above that, there's the enterprise revenue is getting via Microsoft Copilot and other products as well as their own um, enterprise offerings. Uh, the other number, before I come to the big one, it was the number of 86 billion, I think, which is now the valuation of... Yeah. Uh, uh, open AI uh, with the employee stock, uh, uh, you know, uh, stock sale, uh, which is again a massive number. And then obviously all those numbers paled in comparison uh, to the seven trillion number, <laughs> which um, uh, well, I I I I I just admire the sheer audacity of it. Yeah. Uh, you know. I don't actually to reshape the entire chip ecosystem would take. I think a trillion or so is enough for that. Yeah. <laughs> so, so it'd be interesting to figure out why where he's come up with this yeah. number. But it's an audacious number. Absolutely. In fact, uh, Massa of SoftBank uh, is in the market raising a hundred billion dollar. Uh, you know, to kind of you know, I think SoftBank is putting in thirty billion dollars towards that, uh, and seventy billion dollars, I think, from the sovereign funds of of, of Middle East. But then again, I mean, it's honestly, you know, uh, yeah, really a tea, know, tea party compared to what, you know, uh, apparently Sam Ortman has talked about. Sorry, you were saying something. Yeah, no, no, no. I'm just saying that actually, I don't think there is any funder in this world who can even pony up half a trillion. Yeah. I and mean, even if you look at the Middle Eastern, I mean, if you look at the largest sovereign fund ever, right. which is, I think, one of the Scandinavian countries, it's about a trillion or so. Yeah. And that's yeah. huge. And right. that's all of their money. So, All of it, right there. Yeah. <laughs> and so then, you I'm, know, sorry, go ahead. No, no, no. So I have no idea 
Yeah, uh, yeah. This money will come. I, and I think just to put this in context, we're talking about the the global GDP is around hundred trillion. So you know, yeah. so seven trillion is what he's talking about. So anyway, so we'll have to see how it comes up. But you know, Sam Altman, being Sam Altman, uh, you know, kind of came up with this tweet uh, a few days back, and he says, yeah. "Beep beep, why not eight? You know, so I mean, you know, he didn't kind of acknowledge it. He didn't kind of deny it. But you know, uh, you know, just his typical humor. Uh, this tweet. I think that's so uh, typical of Elon and Sam nowadays, right? Yeah, Sam is uh, Altman is the Sam is the new Elon. Okay, Altman <laughs> is the new Musk. Uh, but uh, the interesting part was that this "Why Not Eight tweet mm-hmm. came a mm-hmm. few hours after Sora was launched, which I Absolutely. guess we talk about. And so right. my take on it was that within twenty four hours of launching, Sora has I been agree. Valued. Sora has been valued at one trillion. Absolutely, okay, it's right. gone from seven to eight. I mean, Absolutely. Yeah. And just staying on this part, I mean, just to kind of talk about, you know, the fact that why chips and this whole compute power is so important really comes on, you know, from what really again happened last week, right, towards the end of last week. We had NVIDIA, which has had a spectacular year, uh, you know, and uh, in fact, in, I think in Jan and Feb alone, it showed up around $60, $650 billion worth of, you know, uh, market value. So that's roughly equivalent to Tesla, you know, which is another yeah. fantastic company. And uh, there's been a crazy bull run. So just shows that the whole insatiable, you know, appetite for, for chips, you know, and different form, of course, you know, there's whole question about, is he trying to compete with an NVIDIA or is he trying to co- compete with TSMC, you know, which is the Taiwan, you know, so is it more upstream or downstream? Nobody has a clue. Uh, I think we'll know when we'll know. Uh, but, you know, with, uh, uh, with 7 trillion, it's all streams. It all streams <laughs> everywhere. Yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah. You know. Now, by the way, Microsoft sitting very pretty, right? Three trillion dollars, right? I mean, when I quit, Microsoft is three hundred billion, and I was just wondering, do you still have some shares left? Unfortunately, <laughs> most of just changed the slide very quickly. Yeah, I, I agree. It, it pains me also. <laughs> like you know, I, my last venture took it all away. But anyway, but you know, I think I think apart from all this, which is again a fantastic, very heady week. You know what we're talking about? What you know? Just we talked about. Uh, uh, I think on Thursday or Friday night, and I was awake at that time, I think it was around midnight, when suddenly Sam dropped this, you know, and he talked about the fact that uh, he says, here is Sora, and you probably pronounce that Sora because it's Japanese, which stands for the sky. Uh, and he said that here is our, you know, you know, uh, a text to, you know, video model, right? You know, and I'm, just with, I'm sure you want to say, and I have a f- few slides to kind of show on that, but, you know, you want to just maybe talk about this. So, so I've, you know, yes, uh, uh, the, the following morning in my life was taken over by the Japanese word for sky, yeah. uh, which is Sora. Um, in my view, a couple of things, two, three things. One is that while Sora is not the first text-to-video model out there, there's been right. Runway, it's been Google's product, few others, Pika, but it is qualitatively miles ahead. Absolutely. And it's also... Um, you know, the kind of uh, data it seems to be trained on, the kind of output that it uh, brings out is just a completely different magnitude. And therefore, I believe that Sora is the chat GPT moment for video. Absolutely. Much like chat GPT was the the chat GPT moment for text. uh, This is the chat GPT moment for video. It has several implications. uh, And I think (laughs) one of them will morph into the topic. Discussion. Absolutely. Yeah, but it has several implications. I I would be very worried or excited if I was a graphic designer, a movie maker, a game artist. Uh, but it also has several implications on uh, the whole deep fake uh, story, which I'm sure we right. will talk about. So I'll reserve my reserve my comments uh, around Absolutely. that. You know, so just we just for the benefit of maybe a few who haven't seen a Sora video, I've just got a maybe three of them out here. So this is, I think, the first one that I saw Sam Altman. You know, so Sam Altman just kind of, you know, he like threw the gauntlet out there. He just said that, guys, come up with the most crazy description and I'll, you know, get this thing generated. So here we have a wizard wearing a pointed hat, blue robe with white stars, some kind of a description and here you go. So here you can see, like, I mean, this whole, you know, a single line and look at the imagination. In fact, I think like just we said that there's a lot of discussion happening What's really happening out here? I mean, is it is it diffusion? Is it something using Unreal's engine, you know, from Epic Games, you know, and, and stuff like that, right? So you'll never know until you do it. Uh, yeah, we have maybe your ex bosses. You know, he, he this was probably one of the most spectacular videos, you know, which talks about uh, the, the the really the prompt was about showing a Tokyo street with the the cherry blossom happening at this point in time, 
in the winter, right? And uh, just to kind of show you this, uh, I think the whole, uh, what should I say, the imagery and the and the and the detailing is really amazing. So as you can see, this is uh, you know like, like a drone footage following a couple walking down the streets, and this was a one line prompt. And I think that's why Jaspeet, uh, you know, has been saying that this can really completely shake the whole video world that we're talking about. And then uh, we have Jaspeet uh, on cue. I have this one, uh, which is he even indulged our Kunal Shah. So Kunal being Kunal asked a bicycle race on ocean with different animals as athletes riding the bicycle with a drone camera view. I mean, this can be as vague as it is it can be. And here you go. This is what Sora did for that. It's my favorite. My yeah, absolutely. <laughs> no, I have another favorite one, and I'll just show that one. Like, you know, so th these are yeah. dolphins. Look, we can actually go for two videos and videos. Maybe we should move to elections and deep fakes. Absolutely. You know, <laughs> uh, yeah, I agree. And you well, uh, you know, if you would just allow me one second, I'll just show this. This was my favorite. And uh -huh. did you see this one? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, anyway, just, you know, very quickly, this is all about, you know, Ajay the one. yeah. So, you know, so the people, the unsuspecting people actually then ended up watching a movie of Singham, which was describing this. But yeah, you're right. We we need to kind of, uh, you know, stop, you know, and get back to really the agenda at hand, right? So, you know, uh, uh, Jaspeet, I mean, uh, obviously we've uh, talked about, uh, you know, uh, democracy and we talked about defects. But, you know, why don't you just kind of set the context and say, how did you see defects coming about? How do you define a defect? And, you know, what has been your, uh, you know... Uh, uh, thought around all of that. Sure. Uh, Vivek, uh, deep fakes are predate chat GPT and generative AI. Uh, you know, a lot of people think that it's generative AI, which basically has made deep fakes happen, but no. Deep fakes, I think, started uh, someone in a subreddit, one of the Reddit threads actually talked about uh, creating videos or fake videos, fake visuals, fake content using a particular kind of technology, AI technology called GANs or generative uh, adversarial networks, right. which are invented by, created by a AI researcher with a very unlikely name of Goodfellow, Ian Goodfellow. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, he created this whole GAN uh, concept, which basically implies how two AI systems kind of can play off against each other to create better and better stuff, adversarial networks. And yeah. uh, 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 they, they started happening in, you know, 2014, 15, 16, when they were primarily used by uh, software jocks, if it may, tech bros, to kind of show off their prowess in AI. Uh, but then, you know, obviously bad actors kind of discovered that there could be a lot of stuff which could be done with these. And uh, since then, uh, you know, a lot of these fake videos have been uh, made where uh, someone's real face, a real person's face or body is transposed on uh, someone else and, you know, uh, some other uh, body or face. And so, you know, you think it's the Pope or it's uh, Britney Spears or whoever. Uh, 96% of the videos until recently, deepfakes, were unfortunately used for pornography. And that's what was the biggest use case of deepfakes until recently. Right. But then as um, more and more politicians got into using technology, social media and others, they, I mean, again, the bad actors there discovered that they could use this very effectively to make people say stuff, do stuff, uh, prominent leaders say stuff, do stuff which they hadn't, and therefore completely set or change the narrative or the discourse. Uh, and, and in a lot of elections are won and fought not only on issues, but on uh, actual sentiment and narrative. And that started getting used. Now, the thing uh, that started getting used, and in a few elections, Bolivia, I think, Bangladesh, uh, you know, those uh, uh, videos have managed, Bulgaria, not Bolivia, Bulgaria, uh, managed to actually sway uh, decisions uh, of mm -hmm. people. Uh, and, and so uh, there's a big, huge worry that these GAN-based uh, fake videos uh, will be used, will be weaponized into 2024. And we, we'll talk about 2024 perhaps in a later question uh, yeah. uh, uh, to, to destroy elections, which are the bulwark of democracy and therefore deep fakes subverting democracy. Mm -hmm is the big, big, big issue of 2024. Great. You know, so Jaspeet, uh, you know, last time, uh, you know, uh, and I think some some reaction that comes from people saying that, why is this such a big deal? I mean, like, you know, the yeah. deep fakes, yeah. and, you know, I mean, now everything gets morphed and, you know, we are living in this world, right? And uh, I think a question that I posed to you, which I'll just repeat for the benefit of those who went there, 
was that you know we, we really what i was asking this week is that you know if you think of it i mean democracy is really something that has been an output of really is really the outcome of technology because yeah. democracy is all about dialogues and it's only in today's world where you have newspapers radio and television and now social media that you can have the dialogue with the our stakeholders right and if you take up with the dialogue you know you probably can't have democracy and that's probably the reason why democracy has flourished over the last 200 years and it didn't really exist before that right and and really my question to him was that with the defects and all uh, are we looking at, at, at as a existential threat to democracy because when you can't trust what you are looking at and what you speak in the dialogue breaks down the trust breaks down and and this which is why it's really it's a big deal i mean with 2024 you know i think uh, you know so just be really in that context yeah, how would you want yeah. to answer so it's in a bit of perfect storm which has happened in 2024 and it there are three uh, elements which are creating that perfect storm okay one is the uh, one is uh, deep fakes themselves and the maturing of deep fakes if it may the second is uh, generative ai and especially now sora Uh, yeah. and the third is the fact that half the world and most of the democratic world is going into elections this year yeah. including uh, obviously india the largest democracy us the oldest democracy uk indonesia very large democracy now you are absolutely right vivek that uh, you know uh, democracy started with dialogue and you know it started in the city state of athens Uh, yeah. where you know people could stand up and on the public square talk about stuff and there were citizens and you know the whole thing started and then obviously as media grew you could kind of do that on a on a much larger scale and on country basis and you know that's also mm-hmm. democracy and dialogue are inextricably uh, uh, you know linked to each other and what this three things uh, so while there are elections happening what uh, deep fakes and generative ai threaten to do therefore is to Uh, uh is to is to weaponize deep fakes and uh, uh you know change these narratives to what you know some uh some malevolent actors would would like uh generative ai as i said earlier is not the reason for deep fakes but what generative ai will do is that it makes it 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 helps make in deep fakes much more faster at scale cheaper and so while right. early it required specialized skills of people knowing generative adversarial networks now you know you and me can create a deep fake but there is a fourth element and so so there is generative ai which is creating deep fakes at scale there is the maturity of deep fakes themselves there is elections happening and then there is a fourth thing we which does not get talked about which is uh, the the absolute ubiquitous spread of social media yeah. and uh, you know you and me uh, if we were to uh become bad bad guys sitting in a corner developing a deep fake which shows a leader doing something bad is 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 very satisfactory for us but is useless because if you don't if there's no distribution if you can't spread it mm-hmm. it's 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 powerless but it's social media which at the click of a button can spread it to millions and millions of people and so all of these things coming together uh 2020 if 2023 was the year of excitement of generative ai and ai therefore 2024 is the year which it will be tested and uh, you know uh, there's a lot of uh, um, pessimism around the fact that yeah. democracy will be under real threat uh, just to complete uh, there are it's not new uh, i mean there was cambridge analytica in 2016 uh, yeah. almost 7 years back and it managed to influence brexit as well as the us elections compared to the technologies now cambridge analytica was kindergarten stuff right. and so it's if that could influence those two big huge decisions imagine what can happen now and you know this uh, takes me to a question and i think linking it to what jinal and uh, you know really uh, you know angela are asking right now is that uh, you know how can you really i mean the genie is out of the bottle i mean we have a problem at hand and, and you know and now the question is what measures are there any measures that can now be taken yes. to detect yes. you know the spread of uh, deep fakes i mean you know i think there's a great example of x in some ways uh, in a positive way and then in a negative way and similarly what can be done in terms of education or media literacy and the regulatory framework i mean three prong uh, you know uh, layers absolutely. to that so yeah yes yeah, so you are absolutely so so the answer fortunately is yes but mm-hmm. a huge amount of will is required okay and a huge amount of uh, uh, intention that we will that doing something like this is more important than making money is required right. okay right. so the three things you said three things and it's a trifecta one is technology itself 
Okay, and sh- there are technologies which can detect deep fakes, and those will be and and there are technologies which can be used to uh, uh, fingerprint deep fakes like watermarking, etc. And so you know there is technology itself which can counter bad technology. But case in point, virus, antivirus. But then you know that this is like a continuous arms race, and tech and therefore if someone creates a technology to detect deep fakes, someone else will create a technology which will. Uh, bypass that, and so technology itself is not enough. But right. certainly, it's one. the second uh, is regulation, as you said, and regulation is difficult. But I think right now we are in a bit of an emergency situation. And my view is that if all governments recognize that, forget about regulating all of AI. Let's start with regulating little pieces of it, like deepfakes. Okay, and deepfakes are bad, bad, and so we need to. Uh, I think the immediate thing is to regulate not as much the creation but the spread. Okay, because creation is more difficult to figure out where it happened, but the spread is three or four or five large networks, frankly, and they have enough profit margins, enough money okay, to put in a huge amount of resources if there's a will or if there's regulatory pressure. Okay, to to make that happen and reduce the amount by several, uh, qu- uh, you know, several scales. So that's number two. And yes, you will need to regulate the source also, which is creation. But I think immediately the first thing I would do if I was like this super regulator would be to regulate the spread and the distribution. And the third and finally is, as you said, is the only long term uh, answer is education. Okay, and awareness. And we've done that before. We have done that with the uh, um, tobacco, for example. Right. Okay, and you know it was harmful, and just purely through education and uh, societal movement that got uh, reduced. Uh, we have done that with a few others. Uh, 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 traffic, you know. Otherwise, cars can be big killers. But you know, we've kind of regulated it okay, by setting right. standards. And so, uh, in fact, in uh, uh, in schools, certain schools in Scandinavia. Primary schools, children are being taught to detect deep fakes in their third, fourth, fifth grade, uh, and we will have to do that at a country level, at a society level, at a school, uh, colony level, at a school level, okay, at a corporation level, where if there are, uh, you know, policies against sexual harassment or against uh, financial embezzlement, you can even have education and policies and trainings around that. So the trifecta of regulation, education. And technology, all three need to happen, but they need to happen now, and there needs to be a huge political and uh, uh, societal will behind it. Right. I mean, it's all hands on deck kind of a moment right now. If Absolutely. You're looking at this. Yeah. But the problem is that some governments might want deep fake. Correct. I mean, we've talked about election interference, uh, you know, uh, and that leads to the, a big issue. Yeah, and the problem with deep fakes is not only about knowing, seeing whether this is fake or not. Something which is real can also be claimed to be a fake. Absolutely. Yeah. And that then complicates the this matters. kind of yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's it's a very very nuanced ethical issue. I mean, just to think about it and to get your head around it is is, is really uh, crazy. But you know, in fact, uh, the other challenge that you talked about regulation, you know, isn't let, let's say for example you talked about car manufacturers. Now you know, great. I mean, you know, obviously they need to come with seat belts, they need to come with you know you know airbags and and stuff like that, right? And you have a law in place. Uh, similarly, when you talk about something very dangerous, which is like the nuclear bomb, the whole proliferation, you know, because the nation state kind of come in, you still have, you know, some of the countries which don't comply, but, you know, it's still uh, reasonably, uh, you know, limited. But, you know, the problem, I think what we're seeing is with this easy access to compute power, you know, and what you're seeing now is that people out of sitting out of a basement. You know, can really churn this out. So you might be able to, let's say, go after OpenAI, Google, so and so. You know, but you know, at the at the point of this, it's it's going to be very difficult, right? I mean, in some ways, it seems like a lost war. Though I agree with you that the gateways are the social media, and you know, uh, you can trap not, them. There. It's not difficult. I'm I, okay. I'm sorry, I'm you know, pushing back. There are yeah. much hornier issues of ethics than deepfakes. Okay, mm-hmm. see, is impossible to solve. For example. Okay, bias is almost impossible to solve. Okay, uh, many others. This one, I believe, is possible. But uh, is possible. You can't solve everything hundred percent. But to reduce the effect of it is definitely, definitely possible. We know how to do it. We've done this. Before. Okay, the only question is, will we have the political and societal will and corporate will to do it or not? Otherwise, in my view, it's actually with some very draconian actions. It's possible, but you know, I would uh, please show me a deep fake in China. You won't find one. <laughs> you won't. <laughs> you know, you actually bring up a very good point, and I think let me lead into the next question, which you know some people might find a little provocative, a little outrageous. You know, uh, 
you know, fundamentally, if you think of it, democracy is very, very fragile. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, because the end of the day, what you've seen is even social media. I mean, so many battles have been fought on, fought on social media. And now with the AI and now with things like Sora, we're obviously just complicating the whole issue, right? What is a given is that human beings are very easily influenced because we tend to be very, very emotional. We're not rational beings in that sense, like, you know. And then, you know, when you look at the thinkers, I mean, l l look at somebody like Plato, like, you know, even two and a half thousand years back, like, you know, he his own view on democracy was this is a flawed system. Uh, you know, because the majority's rule will always lead to chaos. It will always lead to populism. And you've seen a lot of that playing out right now. Like, you know, we've seen the prioritization of independent desires versus the common good, right? He believed that the real people who should be leading this world or, or leading a republic should really be the philosopher kings. Like, you know, and, you know, very yeah. interestingly, you mentioned China, right? Again, it's not a democracy. What's worked for them is a very, very authoritarian rule out there. You know, so the question, the provocative question really to you is, do you think that democracy as we know it is, is past its sell by date in that sense? And we need to start thinking of newer models like maybe a sovereign AI or some other construct to kind of deal with. So I will not opine on democracy as a political system. Okay, mm -hmm. there are I, I I don't think I am qualified or knowledgeable enough to, you know, give my but, but I love your perspective because you know the way you look at it is from a different filter. Yeah, but definitely democracy and AI in that sense. And, you know, will will it be possible for the two to coexist in some sense? I think so, yes. I mean, if you, you mentioned nuclear energy, one of the papers that I wrote in Cambridge was about this whole IAEA and the uh, non-proliferation treaty and, you know, whether a similar model could be used for, uh, yeah, uh, and, you know, this was before Sam Altman started talking about it. So I'm rather proud of myself. Uh, <laughs> but if you think about, well, well, has it been successful? Uh, you know, nothing is 100% successful, but at least it has so far prevented another nuclear bomb, uh, you know, another Hiroshima or Nagasaki. So, so uh, arguably successful. Okay. Right. Uh, was it unfair? Was it totally fair? No. Okay, uh, the, and the non-proliferation treaty rewarded the winners of the World War II. Okay, and even till today, we are kind of, you know, saying India should have been a part, Brazil, ABC, etc. And we are not happy. Not fair. Right. Was it done by dictatorships? No. Okay, uh, this was created by amongst the largest democracies in the world. At that time, China wasn't a dictatorship. So four out of five when Russia was kind of halfway, uh, uh, you know, were actually democracies. Mm. Uh, I can go on and on. Okay, I mean, again, I refer to traffic. I find that to be fascinating. Cars can actually, uh, without any standards, can actually kill a million people a day. You know, a car is a very destructive machine. You try and stand in front of a car driving at 80 miles per hour and you know that, you know, it's very, very destructive. But you know, uh, and we've put some arbitrary things, drive on the left-hand side of the road when there's a red light stop. Okay, and people do that, right? Mm. Uh, it, it's not a dictatorship which enforces that. Right. Uh, and so I think it is not past sell by date. I think it is very possible for democracies. We have enough examples to show that. The only problem, in my opinion, uh, Vivek, is that most of these were done at a time when it was largely a unipolar world. Mm -hmm. And one country could stand up and say, you know what, my this way is the high. Yeah. Uh, today, that doesn't exist. So it's not democracy as much as much as geopolitics, which, in my opinion, is the problem uh, with mm. making some of these things happen. You make all countries like a China based party rule system or any other dictatorial rule system. That doesn't mean that we will all be able to work together and create any I think it will be as much of a problem, if not more than what exists today. No, great perspective, uh, Jaspeet. And I think on that, you know, you clearly are a AI and, you know, a democracy optimist in that sense. And I think just picking up on that, uh, you know, cue, there's a question here for Varun and maybe we can enhance that a bit. Is that in your opinion, what role should AI play in enhancing democratic processes rather than undermining them? Oh, and I think the fact question. is that there's so many positives that can we can focus on because we obviously are talking about deep fake and election interference, but you know, there's so many areas. That, so maybe you might want to elaborate on that. Yeah, in this democratic society of mine, there's a drill upstairs which I can't do anything about. So I'm sorry about that. Okay. <laughs> it's not audible. Don't worry. It's at least not great. audible to me. Karan, great question. You know, one of the things I've been saying is that everyone is crying, shouting from the housetops about how AI can undermine democracy or subvert democracy. Actually, there's a lot that AI can do to help democracy. 
Yeah. And there are, and I've written around that, and you know, I, I'll probably post it on the group, uh, on the on the chat, uh, and on the uh, app. Uh, but uh, I'll give you two, three examples. Uh, Democrat, for example, you can actually use AI very well to figure out uh, where there is possible fraud, possibilities of fraud, and you know, police that in advance to kind of you know ballot stuffing or you know whatever. Like the stuff which happened in Pakistan, for example, okay, where there was obvious fraud, and you know, using AI you could have actually helped you know make pat with steady patterns and do. Uh, you can do a lot of voter education with generative AI, and pretty much have you know the messaging of the candidates going to uh, 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 can uh, to uh, 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 to the citizens, uh, you know, at scale, personalized. The way they have not been able to do so so far. I mean, how many people can you get into a rally at the end of it? Earlier on, people used to do phone calls, or they used to get. This bit, I'm sorry. I think your volumes just come down slightly, uh, just a little bit. Uh, yeah, slightly. We were like uh, very loud and you I, We can still hear you. I just think slightly it dropped. But please carry okay. on. With it. I, I have no idea how to change it, frankly. No, uh, then 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 let's not disturb okay. it. No problem. Yeah. yeah. So I'll just speak louder. Okay, yeah. and so so there are ways from generative AI to to kind of uh, you know uh, 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 stop that. There is uh, there are multiple such possibilities to help uh, election commissions to help them draw up the right kind of boundaries and how uh, to logistics of votes and votes uh, collecting the logistics of figuring out what is the right place uh, uh, for a booth to be so that the maximum amount of people can go there. At a partic on a particular day and vote. Um, yeah. It doesn't have to be 9 a.m. to 7 p.m. or whatever it is for every booth in every con uh, 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 constituency. You know, you could kind of personalize and customize to make that happen. So there are multiple ways that AI can be used for the governance, for the logistics, for fraud detection, for messaging, etc., uh, which is not talked about. It's on the other hand, it's it's about the fear itself, which also is real. I am not. I fear as much, but there's, there's other stuff. And this is only elections. For democracy itself, we can get into another, you know, uh, right. thing. But since we are focused on elections today. Right. You know, and uh, the, I think the other question really is that when you see, there could be ways that you could use AI, you know, obviously in a democracy for better governance, right? Uh, people, again, will there will be a pushback, right? Because I think there will also be ethical concerns about data biases, privacy, you know, can we turn this into a, a surveillance economy? And stuff like that. I mean, what do you have to say about that? And uh, and uh, you know, again, to your other point, I think somebody had asked right at the start: Can we use uh, technology itself to kind of you know, uh, uh, you know, kind of stop election interfering? Right? I mean, uh, you know, you again talk about a form of a GAN, right? I mean, another adversarial system which is taking on something else. And how do you think about? It? I mean, do you think ethically? So, yeah. So the surveillance economy that you spoke about is a much bigger, thornier area than, deep, for example, to solve. I agree. In my opinion. Orwellian completely, right? Yeah, because there is, the borders are so blurred as to what is protection what versus what is spying in a sense. Okay, so right. cities like London, cities like Hyderabad, Delhi, okay, are blanketed with CCTV cameras. Blanketed. You cannot. There's not a square footage of space which is not under a camera, mm -hmm. and you therefore are surveilled at every possible moment. And the and the and and the algorithms which kind of then detect uh, then predict whether you are doing something suspicious or not have a huge amount of bias. In. If you have a particular race or a color or religion, uh, the algorithms would be biased to uh, point a finger at you, and you know, uh, and you know, uh, uh, someone would come and <laughs> arrest you. And so, uh, but on the other hand, on the other hand, these these blanketing of cameras have stopped unknown numbers of crime, terrorist attacks, okay, unknown numbers. Many of them are never diverged. And so, you know, where do we draw the line? Do we, uh, I, if you kind of move from CCTV cameras to just the uh, digital public infrastructure like Aadhaar, UPI, uh, and Digi Atra, where, you know, you just, the face allows you to go inside an airport, which basically means someone can track you all the time as to what you're doing, what you're buying, where you are, what are your intentions? Everything. And, and that's been taken to an extreme in China where, you know, people have developed something called a social score. Anyway, I'll leave that for maybe a surveillance-based uh, yeah. uh, topic. But what I would draw back and say is that, look, this is a much bigger concern area to me than deepfakes. Deepfakes are hugely concerning. 
I believe in my little head that they there is still some way to control them or minimize the damage. With some of the other areas like surveillance, it's just so much more difficult to figure right. out what's right and what's wrong. So great points, Jaspreet. You know, we we promise we'll keep this for around thirty minutes. Thirty. We have we have we have gone past that, but maybe one last question from your side, also linking it to a question that was asked earlier uh, from the audience, is that you know how do you see this evolve? Like you know, I mean, you know, because like we said, I mean, all of us while we've been we've been what should I say? You now we are used to seeing these kind of you know drops coming in from Google and so on, and from OpenAI, but yet the Sora caught us by surprise, right? And I think. What do you think will happen over the next ten years? You know, let's not even look beyond that. I don't know whether we can imagine, but yeah. Ten years for AI, ten years for deep fakes, ten years for elections, ten years for democracy. Which one? All of. I mean, just I, I, we tried. You know, I mean, I mean, the question is that you know, ultimately we're here, and all of them are interlinked, right? So I just see. How do you see? What do you see? Let's say, for example, what do you see happening in twenty thirty four? No, so I, you know, I have no idea what OpenAI will do next week. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Forget about 2034. I have absolutely stopped, um, you know, predicting. Uh, I was at Singularity University and one of these very famous tech leaders who will not name came up and said, have a six month uh, planning cycle. <laughs> okay. And have a 10 year vision. Okay. So, mm. you know, that three year, four year doesn't work. But, but, but the Uber thing I will say to your answer, and I'll again keep it contextual to uh, the topic of today, which is the whole deep fakes and whatever. My well, I have two views. I have an optimistic view and a pessimistic view. Uh, mm. But the optimistic view still reigns; is still more dominant. I, I personally think that we, as human beings and society, will we have always coped. We have muddled through That's many true. times. We have muddled through. I mean, there have been uh, sometimes it's taken a Hiroshima for us to realize, yeah, uh, uh, or a Holocaust or whatever to realize, but. We have muddled through. If you think of the first greatest invention ever by human being, the first greatest invention ever arguably was fire. For the first 10,000 years, none of us know there were no scribes or whatever. I can, But I can assure you that people used to think of it as the most dangerous technology ever created mm. because you could not control fire. You know, it would just, you know, it, yeah. you know, it would just kill you. And it was horrific death and, you know, whatever. But we not only lived with it, but we also managed to, uh, control it and use it. The same thing with electricity. Electricity is super dangerous, massively dangerous. Okay. And then you can go on to nuclear energy. Actually, if you go back and see every technology that we have, we mankind has invented, big general purpose technology, almost every one of them has had a, a very dangerous side to it. And sometimes the dangerous side is first seen. Mm -hmm. uh, even the Gutenberg press had a very dangerous side. The church didn't like it at all because you know, it kind of proliferated and it, it, they, they were not the sole controller of messages. And uh, so every tech has that, but we have coped. We have muddled through. And I think the same will happen here. Uh, so in 2034, we would still be worrying, Vivek. You would still be asking me, you know, what are we going to die tomorrow because of all of this? Okay. <laughs> and we would still be excited by the Sora, which kind of comes right. out at that time. Right. Feel Wonderful, Jaspreet. As always, it was uh, fantastic talking to you and really getting a perspective, you know. Uh, and it's great to hear, you know, somebody, you know, like you, who's actually researched so much and still has come out as an optimist. Because when you look at other speakers, I mean, they're really doomsday predict, you know, what should I say, predicting, uh, you know, uh, a catastrophe that's, you know, imminent. But uh, it's great to, you know, kind of hear okay, the positive view. Please get more likes on uh, Twitter. <laughs> there you go. The social media, the matrix is you know, controlling us <laughs> out there. Yeah. No, but wonderful. And I think, you know, look forward, forward to having you back next week. I believe it won't be a Monday since we'll be traveling. So we'll share the, the date and the time Absolutely. soon on that. Yeah. 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 And, you know, like we can't predict what OpenAI is going to do next week. You know, we will have to live with the flow of how... And so, yeah, look forward to uh, talk again next week. It might not be a Monday. No. All right. Wonderful. Have a great day ahead. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much.